You still glad you're in church? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. I got a message for you. It's Sunday, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Got your Bible this morning. I'm going to get into the Word this morning. Uh, um, I just, it was, I, I got to tell you this story. It's kind of funny. What I do on Saturday nights, we come together Saturday nights and pray. And um, what I generally do is I give Saray, because my Saray is, Saray is my publicist. Um, she's a, my translator. She's, she's a lot of different things. Anyway, so uh, I said, go always give Saray, the, I said, my message for tomorrow. I always give it a Saturday night. I said, and my message is going to be removing the veil. Removing the veil. And um, so she says, okay. So she writes it down. And this morning she says, um, we're in the war room with, with the leadership. And she says, she says um, uh, that's removing the curtain, right? <laughs> no, it's not a curtain. It's a veil. <laughs> so praise the Lord. My title of my message this morning is removing the veil. Amen. And I went... But uh, I mean, you know, how many as believers, sometimes you strain to hear the voice of the Lord in direction? Raise your hand if you have problems. You strain sometimes to listen. I'm going to help you out this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, how many know that God always, always, is always speaking? I don't know if that's a revelation to you, but he always is. Matter of fact, the Bible says this. I love this scripture in Jeremiah. Jeremiah says the oceans, because we live on an island, a uh, two-by-four island. I love this scripture. I'm glad Jeremiah prophesied it. He said, but he said, the oceans are held back from overtaking the land by perpetual decree. A perpetual decree is something that God has decreed. So we get to live in Key West on a two by four island that's about 11 foot above sea level uh, by perpetual decree. <laughs> so God is always speaking. Uh, the, the, the world turns. Everything is in motion because of God's voice. So what about the believer? I want to talk about it this morning. Uh, it, it, Paul mentioned this emphatically. I want to get to, to what he says this morning. But God often, here's the thing, a lot of problems we don't always hear God speaking uh, to us is because he speaks uh, in a deeper than our understanding. So I want to go cover some of the things this morning. And, and, and uh, I'm glad he does speak. Uh, you are sitting in... Uh, um, this morning you're sitting in this ministry, you're sitting in this church building, all of the things that God has, has spoken to us and we've carried out and done according to his word, as, as we heard it. And uh, from even back when I was traveling and going to the mission field, of course, anymore with the pandemic and the airlines, uh, my, um, my travels are around my yard and <laughs> around town. But we, back in the day, uh, I would listen to the voice of the Lord. He would say, go such and such a place, do such and such a thing. And it was paramount to listen to his voice. I want to give you some, uh, some help this morning. We'll go some, over some scriptures. But God, God often speaks in a way that's kind of above our pay grade sometimes. We're expecting to hear a voice uh, because we need information. How many's ever been there? I need an answer. How many's ever had a question? I need an answer. So what happens is when we approach this thing as I need, it immediately opens up to a, a, a narrow spectrum of what we're going to hear. I need an answer. So God, I'm asking you, give me an answer. How many how many's ever been there? Okay, praise God. I'm talking to the right crowd then this morning, right? And, and he's like, well, I don't know. He didn't. And then we, the thing is, what always bugs me, and so he's bugged me for a long time, is that whenever we have a, a, a faith failure or something that doesn't go, go our way, there's no really such thing as a faith failure, but it doesn't go our way, we tend to want to come up with a new doctrine. Because we can't experience a certain thing. Well, I guess God doesn't move that way anymore. I guess God doesn't do that anymore. Understand something, that the failure, whenever we pray, the failure is not on God's end, but always our end. Somehow, some way, it's always on our end. God says what he says, his word is true for today, and this is it. But if we're looking for a specific answer, okay, uh, there's several reasons why we don't get that answer a lot of times. I'm going to get to the scripture in a minute. But it, and one of it might be because he's already given it to you. And we're expecting God to repeat himself. Uh, because we weren't intent of the first time to hear it, and now we expect, you know, and, and different things like that. There's different reasons. As we walk our faith walk, it is by faith. Amen. Not by things seen, but by things unseen is how we, how we get by on everything with God. So, praise the Lord. How many are, waited, are, are, are 
ready to hear a message that's going to help them enhance them a little bit in hearing the voice of the Lord. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you this. I'm going to, <laughs> uh, are you going to do the next thing he says? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, praise the Lord. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> you got to understand something. I've been in the ministry a long time. And a lot of my ministry is dealing with ministers, not so much anymore, but used to be dealing with ministers. When I went to, to the foreign field or the mission field, a lot, of the, my, uh, a lot of my talking and different sharing with different things were for groups of ministers and talking to different ministers. And basically what I found out is we are all on board with God if we've got a problem that we don't have an answer for. Okay. So we're focused on that particular problem. So the only thing that's going to satisfy that particular question is when we hear what we want to hear for an answer. <clears throat> All right, praise the Lord. I got your attention. Anyway, praise the Lord. Amen. How many know that, this, that through the Lord's Prayer, through what he's given us, we've actually been given an assignment to, uh, to pray his will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Amen. We've been given an assignment as a church. I said this before. I said, you know, how many have read the Great Commission? You read the commission that Jesus gave his disciples. Was not, how many know it wasn't just for his disciples, it's for us today. We're his disciples today. And the commission is still good. I said it's a great commission, not the great su uh, list of suggestions. It's like yeah. the commandments aren't, are the commandments are not the great list of suggestions. Yeah. But when we begin to treat the word of God like it's, optional and suggestions, then what happens, for some reason his voice gets fainter and fainter and fainter where we're concerned because God speaks through his voice. Let me go ahead and get, some, uh, get through this. But we've been given, a, we've been given an assignment by God to, to, uh, that his will be done on the earth. So here's what happens. We have to re realign, it's a realignment for us to accomplish God's purpose in the earth. When we get on that framework, that we're going to accomplish God's purpose in the earth. So whatever's in heaven, God's desire is to bring here. Amen? And whatever is here is also connected to heaven. The Lord's Prayer. How many, how many know what we call the Lord's Prayer? Because it's not really a Lord's Prayer because it confesses sin and Jesus in heaven. <laughs> so, but the fact is, our Father which art in heaven, how be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So there's, there's, a, there's a caption right there. The church has a lot of catching up to do because basically whatever go, goes in heaven. So let me ask you this. Is there any sickness and disease in heaven? No. Then there should be no sickness and disease here. So how can we experience all the sufferings that we experience here when God clearly says he wants the will of heaven? Simply because we live in a fallen world. We lived in a fallen world since uh, um, Adam got confused on what tree to touch. <laughs> so in that falling state what he did so he said well how come God just can't come down and sovereignly move interesting isn't it how many has ever owned property anywhere uh, I'll use my, myself for an example uh, um, I used to own property down here and uh, basically uh, I had rental units that I used to rent out to people and uh, they would, I owned them but they, the rental units were I rent them out so people would come, they want a place to live. So Do you know, legally, according to the laws, that if I rent out a place, though I have the title, I have the master key to get in the door, I cannot enter that home without permission. Did you know that? Some of you who rent have the same thing. Hmm. But I own it. I have deed title to it. So God can say that about the earth. But when he gave Adam the lease... And Adam turns it over to, the de to, the, to Satan. Now God is waiting for permission to come in what he owns, to come into our life. He made you a, a, a free will person who, who has a free will. He protects that right for you to decide. If you don't want to go to heaven when you die, you can decide to go to hell. And God will protect your right to go to hell if you want to. Stupid if you do, but I mean, he will protect that right because we are free will. You understand that? Okay, so what happens is anything a part of our life, just briefly, anything a part of our life, uh, God owns it. He has deed title to everything in the earth that you can see. It all belongs to him. The scriptures say that. Cattle on a thousand hills. This all belongs to him. 
but he's taken the lease of that and turned it over to Adam, and through the, Adam's descendants, we now have that lease and a right to live here. That's how we live here. That's how we breathe the air here. That's how we uh, survive here. So now we need help from the creator who owns this place. What do we do? We give him permission to come into our life, come into our health through faith, through his, his uh, uh, permissions that he has set up, faith is one, through the Son of Jesus, through the name of Jesus, now gives him permission to come in and begin to work on our behalf. And understand this. I said this last week, I'll say it again. If we treat God like our servant, he will frustrate you to the day you die. Because he is not our servant on quite the opposite. We are his. Now, if we get the relationship right, when we do the inviting in, now we're on different territory, aren't we? So what I had to, what, I'll use me for an example again, but the fact is, is when I first got into the ministry, I didn't realize this stuff, and I learned this stuff as I went in the ministry, but the ministry is on. I said, well, Lord, I'm doing your work. So if I'm doing your work, then basically, shouldn't I be enjoying your blessing? And in the ministry, we had lack, we had debts, we had all things going, going forth, not today, but we did back then, until God showed me. He says, listen, he says, are, are you co-laboring with my plan, or are you doing your own plan? I said, well, yeah, this is your church. I mean, I'm preaching your word. I mean, I'm, I'm ministering to your people. I'm praying. I'm doing this. I'm going from this nation to that nation, going around the world. I've been on five different continents preaching your word. What, I mean, what, what are you talking about? He said, but yes. He said, are you wanting me to bless your plan, or are you involved with what I'm telling you to do? made all the difference in the world when I began to switch. You know, I did the same thing, but I shift my idea from God will just bless this because I'm walking in it. That's all there is to it. To where, you know, Lord, I'm going to follow your directions and be directed by you. When, so he says nothing is, is off the table in. The person that says this, let me just shift gears for a minute. The person that says this, that I cannot hear from God, I've never heard from God, and I do not know how to hear from God, then, that, but is it, then I have to ask the question, are you born again? Because if you are born again, then I will say that is wrong. You may not recognize his voice, but if you're born again, you heard the voice of God. Are you here? How many of you have an opportunity of being born again, all of a sudden get so far and then reject the idea and walk away? You too heard from God. And chose according to what you heard. And again, God protected your free will to choose. Hallelujah. This is going to be an interesting teaching this morning. I can tell by the looks on your faces. Praise the Lord. God bless you. And I thank you for people. I love to preach to people that are here. Amen. As well as people out there. Amen. Glory be to God. All right. So people that say, well, I'll never hear from God. So. So let's go back. Maybe the problem is not our hearing, but our perception. Maybe instead of changing how we hear, maybe we need to change our perception. Let me go ahead and read a scripture and uh, help you out this morning. Praise the Lord. Can we read a scripture? If you got your Bible this morning, turn with me just to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to go over a couple of scriptures. I was looking over this. I thought this was uh, pretty cool. And this matter of fact, this is where I get the title for my message. And by the way, it is a veil. It's not a curtain. Hallelujah. I think of curtains, these lacy things. You know, I think of a veil. Remember the veil in the temple? That thing was four to six inches thick. And when Jesus was crucified and when he resurrected, God split that thing from top to bottom and it opened up the place of the holies of holies. You, the only ones that could go in there were the priest. But when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, it changed all that. The priesthood had to, took a different role. Sacrifices, blood sacrifices of lambs, goats, and sheep and all, ended at the, at, the, at the resurrection of Christ because he was the Lamb of God. But I, I like it because the temple had a veil, and this veil was it was it was different colors. It was they had, you find it in the Book of Exodus where they put this thing together. But it was estimated four to six inches thick, and God just ripped that thing open. I shared with it last week. I says the same word for ripping that veil or renting the veil was the same word used that when uh, when God peeled back the heavens or opened the heavens when Jesus was baptized. It was a forceful ripping apart. 
the same way, this is the same Greek word for renting the veil in the temple. I think it's pretty cool. Thing was veil, not a curtain. Sorry. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Curtains. <sighs> anyway, praise the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Let me say that again. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Taken away. So how do we get rid of the veil that is shrouding what we need to see or hear? How do we get rid of that? By turning to the Lord. Can't, this is an old phraseology. Well, I'm an old person, so I'll just use an old phrase. But you, the old timers used to say this. We need to lean in to listen to what God has to say. I like that. Lean into his presence. Lean into what God has to say. Uh, if you're sitting in, in, in somebody's, and you're trying to eavesdrop on a conversation, of course, this is the church ever does that, right? Uh, but you're sitting in a restaurant or something, and somebody's talking real low, and, and, and you picked up something that you want to hear, and you kind of lean over, <laughs> kind of see, and even cup your ear like this to kind of hear what they're saying. It's the, same, it's the same thing with the Lord. We lean into what he has to say. When the veil is removed, this is what opens up. But Paul was saying, now, so where did Paul get this? Let me get, put it back in context for just a minute. <clears throat> Paul was talking to Jewish followers of Christ. And it says, when they picked up the book and they read Moses, a veil was placed over their heart. Now, there was nothing wrong with, with Moses. There's nothing wrong with the Torah. There's nothing wrong with the book of law. But the, Paul said, when you open this up, there's a veil that comes over your heart. What was, he what was he talking about? He's talking about what happens is we do this religiously because there was certain times of the day that they just did this out of habit. They, they, they opened it up. When we get into religious settings and religious habits, it actually, according to Paul's word, puts a veil over our hearts to where we cannot hear what he's saying. And, his, and the truth has been kept from us. So he says, so this is what he says. He said, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, well, I thought opening my Bible was turning to the Lord. No, 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 we can do this habitually. We can just do this out of, uh, I got a plan, and I can do, read this scripture on this day and read this scripture on that day, and that's all I can do. I can read those. How many ever sat down with a, with a, nothing wrong with that, by the way, but read the scripture and then closed the book and said, what did I just read? That's the veil. What, what, I mean, uh, I like another phrase. He says, what do we, what, what is, I'll get to this in a minute in Romans, but the fact is, what, is it, what do we read here? Well, we read, and here's what the old timers just say too, we keep reading until we hear what God speaks. We keep reading until we hear God speak. I'll get that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. Amen. But what Paul is saying, he's saying, you pick up the book of Moses as you do through the law, and you read, and a veil is placed over your heart. So you have no revelation of God. You cannot hear his voice audibly or any other way uh, by your heart because that veil is placed. But he says, when you, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. All right? Are, are you ready this morning? Yes. Okay. We're just, we're just getting warmed up. I thought this was interesting, so I wrote it down in my notes. The very next verse, this is, verse, this is 2 Corinthians 3, 16. Now listen to this. The very next verse is probably going to be a little bit more familiar to you. And verse 17 says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Are they putting it on the screen behind me? I didn't turn around. Okay, praise the Lord. Can you see that? All right. Can they see it on camera? Okay, that, that's a, okay. praise the Lord. So, but the very next verse, Paul shifts gears. He's talking about, wait a minute, the veil is taken away. Now all of a sudden, now the Spirit Lord is with the Spirit Lord is his liberty. Lo and behold, I looked up that word liberty in the, in the Greek, and you know what it means? You know what the word actually means in the Greek? Liberty. <laughs> freedom. The word means freedom. So what happens, let's say, verse 16 again, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Then he's saying, where the Spirit of the Lord is. He shifts when the veil is taken away, the Spirit of the Lord comes in, and where the Spirit of the Lord comes in, there's a freedom now. There's a freedom that didn't exist before the veil was taken away. There's a freedom now that exists that didn't exist before. Something changed. The, what changed, and what caused all that change was us turning now to the Lord. What does that mean to turn to the Lord? I need more explanation, Pastor. I mean, it's good, but it's a good saying, but I need more explanation to it. When we begin to put our attention and our focus now on what God 
has for us purposed here in the earth, when his will for us in the earth becomes in line with our attention, and we begin to act upon that attention, now the veil is removed. Now the voice comes through clearer. Because it's no longer what I need to hear to feel, to, to feel good or to take care of this problem, but now I am listening to the Lord to see what is my next thing that he wants me to accomplish in the earth. Because if I can accomplish the things he has for me in the earth, the purpose, all these other things shall be added to you. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things are added. We want all the other things first and then add the kingdom on, tacked on the ends so we feel good about ourselves. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Uh, I'm just, uh, just preaching. I like, took that word liberty, and then I, I, I went and on the internet, and I found this. I thought this was interesting. I just threw this in here. So this is in, threw it in an extra charge. Benjamin Franklin said this. Remember Benjamin Franklin? For all the people that don't study history anymore, he's one of the founding fathers of the Constitution. So anyway, ben, Benjamin Franklin once said this. Those who would give up essential liberties to purchase a little temporary safety deserves neither liberty nor safety. <clears throat> Those that will give up, I'll, let me put the scriptural end that, that, to what Benjamin Franklin, uh, what he said, but he, let me put the scriptural end. Those that give up the attention to the Lord those that will turn their face away from God deserve neither safety nor liberty from the Lord. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not quoting Benjamin Franklin as scripture, but I mean, is that what it says? Where the spirit of the Lord is liberty, but it only comes after we've turned to the Lord and the veil has been removed. So now that we got you turned to the Lord, we got the veil removed, can we go on, go on, go on with some teaching? It's, it's amazing what God has put, to, put together. Matthew chapter 11, verse 15, Jesus said this, He who have ears, let him hear. Interesting statement, uh, uh, he that have ears, let him hear. In other words, everybody has ears. Is there anybody here with any, any ears? I didn't say hearing, I just said ears. You got these things on the side of your head that flop in the wind? Ears, okay. Uh, uh, he says, so he that have ears, let him hear. It, what it is, it's a proverbial expression that implies the highest attention given uh, to what is spoken. It's that leaning in. What were they saying? Did I hear my name mentioned? Are they talking about me? It's a leaning in. Praise the Lord. Are we okay? Amen. 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 Seven times in the book of Revelation, Jesus said that he that hath ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches. To the churches. Now, when he says churches, he's not talking about the building. He's not talking about even an assembly. He's talking about members thereof. Jesus spoke a lot about corporate uh, blessings, corporate anointings, opposed to individualism. Individualism is something that... that, that, that uh, people have come up with uh, through the scripture. But if you study the scriptures more often, you will find more corporate than you will individualism. Now, we do have individual needs, individual purposes. God has made everybody different. There, so there is an individualism. But when it is put together, how many know that Paul put it this way? He said, when we come together, each one of us has a part. So when we stay, and, and Paul also called the, the, the church is the body of Christ. Jesus Christ, I'll say this again, I've said this a thousand times, but Jesus Christ died for his church. Amen. I know we want to individualize that to say Jesus Christ died for me. Well, if you're part of the church, he died for you. It's like, it's like the Bible says, he says, Jesus is coming back for those that are looking for him. So if you're not looking for him, I guess he's not coming back for you. <laughs> yeah. But the fact is, is he's looking for those that are coming back for him. Yeah. So he looks at the church corporately as a body of Christ. Paul broke it down to we, even there's parts, individual. And can one part say that we have no need for the other part? He says, no, you can't do that. Amen. We need all the parts of the body of Christ. Understand something. We come together as a church ministry. You're not coming here to hear lectures. I'm not a college professor. We're not doing lectures. What we're doing is grabbing a message that's going to carry us through this season or this time period together. So when you come together in the church, this is what's important. There's agreement. If you don't understand God's principles to prayer, where two of you agree in touching anything, it'll be done to them. Not you, them. 
it'll be done unto them. So basically what Jesus is saying is when we come together in agreement, there is more power than individual. So can you see the benefit of the enemy or the devil to keep us separate and isolated? Can you see the benefit now? Let's just go ahead and stay isolated, keep them isolated because they're weaker if we can keep them apart. But when they get together and give them an, an agreement, man, nothing that they do can, can, can stop. It'll keep on going. So this is, this is the thing. So how many know we come together as a church? We're a church body. We're more, we're more powerful with the power of God together than we are individually. It's the devil's plan to keep you separate. Because then he can have you for lunch. Are you here? So no, it can't be. Pastor, I heard scripture. The devil used scripture on Jesus. The three temptations that came with Jesus were all about scripture. Oh, if you be the son of God, turn these rocks into loaves of bread. Jesus said, get you behind me, man. Does not live by bread alone. But by every, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How do we live? By every word of God that proceeds out of the, his mouth. Well, if you're really son of God, throw yourself off this cliff. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus, and Jesus got to the third one. He says, buzz off. <laughs> and guess what? He did. <laughs> he did. Praise the Lord. I guess, it's, you know, it, I guess it's, it's been exaggerated, his power, talking about the devil anyway, his, his power. Amen? Amen? When we come before God, here's another thing I want you to understand. We come before God, we owe God. We owe him. We owe him a response of faith. It is always, it's always the attempt of the enemy to always lead us, in unto, uh, to lead us in unbelief because unbelief stands in defiance against his very nature of faithfulness. So understand something, because this is we, what we're doing now is let's plan on aligning ourselves so we can hear. How many want to hear the Holy Spirit better? Amen. Then let's, let's align ourselves to that purpose and of listening and hearing. So understand something. When we stand, when we stand in unbelief, when God says to come by faith, and we stand in unbelief, then we stand in, the enemy can lead us into that defiance, and it's a defiance against what God has called us to do. And when we stand in that defiance, then basically we begin to lose track of his voice and be able to hear, give the ability to hear. Romans 10, 17, I'm going to go through there, and i got some stories I'm going to share with you. You okay this morning? Uh, what I'm, what I have to, I've got to lay some groundwork. Everybody comes from different backgrounds. I'm going to lay some groundwork so you understand what we're talking about. We're talking about hearing the voice of the Lord. I know probably 90% in this room, just guessing, I didn't take a survey, but 90% you're waiting for a word. <laughs> Give me a word. Give me a word. I, I, I you know, I, I've been in conferences, prophetic conferences before I've, Spoke at different things before, but this is what I've always noticed. In the conference when somebody uh, wants a prophetic word, give me, a, give me a prophetic word. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. Uh, uh, I believe in a prophetic word, and we give a prophetic word here. That helps us when we can get around a team that can give us a prophetic word and give us prophetic guidance. But here's a couple of things, a couple of things I noticed uh, uh, that is a problem is basically we think it's going to come to pass tomorrow or exactly when we need it. Or basically, we don't like the word at all. I cannot see that anything in that at all, so we basically dismiss it. Both of those scenarios are not bringing the purposes of God, or is it us uh, uh, re re embracing that by faith? I mean, what I, what I did and was encouraged to do is whenever somebody uh, gave me a word uh, uh, over my life, or prophesied, as you, if you will, with the gift of prophecy, uh, that was recorded, and I took that cord and I wrote it down. Years later, I would take out and say, you know what I found out? I found out sometimes it was years before those words ever came to pass. I mean, I remember one time, it was, it was years ago. Uh, God is going to bring you uh, in, in front of, uh, of leaders of countries, and God is going to bring you here. You've got to be kidding me. I'm trying to build a little church here, you know, <laughs> in my mindset. And it was, I think it was 2003, somewhere around there, uh, I was in, in uh, Ghana, West Africa, and brought before the king of Kamasi, who's the king of the Ashanti tribe, you understand the African culture, uh, the Ashanti tribe. And, he, uh, and we were there, uh, Bill and I were there, sitting in the, in the room, uh, waiting to see this leader of the country. Wait a minute, that's, that's, that's a democracy. You think it is. 
<laughs> they have a president, and it's in Accra, Ghana, which is the capital. You think he's the president. <laughs> what rules in the West African community was the largest and the most powerful tribe. Still, even today, uh, that is the case. And the king of Kamasi, because Kamasi was with the was with the town where he ruled, was the, was the center of the Ashanti. Basically, he was the one that was meeting with the president of the Ghana, and they were coming up with country policies. I found the same thing in, in the Ivory Coast. But the, this, this, anyway, so, so the prophecy that came was not what I was expecting. But nonetheless, it came to pass. I found myself sitting in the palace in Kamasi. <laughs> and I thought, Lord, what am I doing here? He said, remember that word. You know, so so there, is, there is a ground for that. But what about the everyday average Christian, what I want to talk about, uh, that we depend on the voice of the Lord for the next business decision, for the next thing on how to raise our kids, for the next wisdom that we need uh, in, in that arena? Okay, God has an input for that also. Amen? Praise the Lord. Are we, are we getting it so far? All right. Amen. Uh, I was reading Romans chapter 10, verse 17, and I had ideas of like something. Let me go ahead and read the scripture. Romans chapter 10. You turn your Bible if you want to turn your Bible there. I want you, I want you to see this because maybe you had some of the same ideas in, in, uh, in your mind. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Say amen when you get there. Amen. See, I don't hear, we don't hear pages turn anymore. You got... <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord. It says this, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How many know that scripture? I'll read, I'll read it again. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How many have been taught that faith comes by hearing the word of God? You have. How many don't have a clue what that means? Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> faith comes by hearing, by hearing by the word of God. But this is what... It's been a common misconception, but the fact is, that's not what it says. Here's what it says. It says, then faith comes by hearing, comma. Faith comes by hearing, comma. Hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. Now we're talking about what's building faith. So where's faith come from? By hearing, hearing by the word of God. So what it was saying is, in other words, we read the scriptures. And I do this, by the way. I read the scriptures. But if I could get more faith by just having preaching or scriptures to me, I would go to bed with, with, uh, with uh, somebody just reading the Bible, reading the Bible. So but basically, sublineal, I'll just pick that stuff up in my sleep, and I, I, I would wake up the next morning, I have the faith of Jesus. But that's not what it says. No, it says, it says basically, it's, it's saying faith comes by hearing, not by reading. Faith comes by hearing. Now, there's nothing wrong with reading. But what he's saying in essence, he says faith comes by hearing. In other words, we're going to hear the word of God through what he's already written down. But the faith is going to come from hearing his voice, not by reading his scripture. What's going to come by reading the scripture is the insight of what he's saying. Does that help anybody? So, I mean, you've got to get this, this correct. So basically what God says, he says, see this word, this word isn't going to change. This is my word. So as you read this word and understand this word, now we hear what God is saying in line with this word. So the old timers used to say this when, reading, when you're reading the Bible, just keep reading until you hear. Keep reading, keep reading the book until you hear him speak. And that is about the clearest thing I can give you as far as... So faith comes by hearing. We need to hear the word of God, which builds our faith. Faith, another word for faith, is trust, which builds our trust into the Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Help me by this morning. Amen. Amen. Now you're ready for the next level up. Okay, we got faith. Okay, so basically we understand by the word of God that as we begin to read the Word of God, okay, He is going to begin to speak to us. We're going to hear the Word of God through the Scripture, and that hearing of His Word is going to build up our faith. And, uh, and understanding, too, but it's going to build up our faith. You got that? Praise the Lord. I was looking in Genesis chapter 22, 
and I was looking about Abraham. Abraham is, is, is the father of many nations. Abraham is, is the guy. Abraham talked with God. How many of you have read about Abraham? Then one day God spoke to him. This is a pretty good example. One day God spoke to him and says, he said, I want you to take Isaac, your only begotten son, and I want you to go to Salem. It was in, uh, in, a, in the mountain region that time. I want you to go to Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice Isaac on that mountain. In other words, I want you to kill him. I want you to kill your only son. So Abraham packs up donkey, puts a wood on Isaac, and says, Isaac, because you carry this, and, and, and they're marching off to Salem. Salem, another word for Salem, is Jerusalem, where they were to get Jerusalem from. Okay, are you ready for this? Okay, so anyway, he goes up there. Now, he heard a word from the Lord. Was that a true word from God? Yes. So in Abraham's mind, for three days' uh, journey, Isaac is going to be sacrificed on the altar. You see, the th here's, here's where a lot of people make a mistake. They heard God, but are you hearing him? Because when Abraham got there, he set up the altar, he put the wood on the altar, he laid Isaac down, he said, and, and Isaac said, well, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? He said, God will provide himself the lamb. He said, and Abraham did what? He raised the knife. Do you see the same thing in Genesis 22? Yeah. Now, aren't you, would, if you were Isaac, wouldn't you be glad that he didn't stop hearing God? Now, he had a word from the Lord. Word, this is what God said. Matter of fact, it says in, 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 in the New Testament, it says that Abraham actually had the faith that if he killed Isaac, that he had the faith in God that God would raise him from the dead. So in Abraham's mind, Abraham was saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to kill a boy, but you're going to raise him back up because this is the one that's going to lead the nations. This, this is his, out of his seed is going to come the nations that you promised me. But when he raised the knife, aren't you glad he, instead of hearing God, that he kept on hearing because you had a word of the Lord, are we missing the change where God begins to change things? Yes. So it's, it's imperative not just to hear what God is saying, but also uh, our, I've heard what he said, but also hearing what he says. Amen. How many ever come to church and, and, and heard something different in the scripture that they're familiar with? Amen. And then the next week the same thing happened. Yes. Keep on hearing. <laughs> Keep on hearing, not just heard. Oh, y'all been to church before, right? You've been to church once, you've been to church, you know, I mean, that, that's it. You've been to church once, you've been to church a thousand times. That's that veil. Amen. The lift removing of the veil brings us something different. Isaac was glad because Abraham kept on listening because the God says, stop. Mount Moriah, are you ready for this? Mount Moriah today, if you go to Jerusalem, or go in Jerusalem, Salem, the Mount, Jerusalem's on a mountain, you know, if you know that. But that was Salem, that was in Abraham's time, where he built the altar and raised the knife to kill Isaac is where the Temple Mount sits today. Mount Moriah is right there on the Temple Mount. Shortly, short distance from there, Jesus Christ was crucified. God's only son was sacrificed on that Mount Moriah. So what he was saying, coveting, he said, if you're willing to sacrifice your son, I'll make you the father of many nations. But so where he stopped him from sacrificing Isaac because there wasn't going to be a resurrection. The next resurrection that was going to take place there was going to be the son of God. He said, because you didn't hold back your son, now I will have my son crucified, dead and raised from the dead in that very same place. And from that time, Abraham had covenant with God. Life for life. He said, because you're not, you're, you're not willing to hold back anything of which I ask, he said, then I will not hold back from what the world needs. Amen. And it was an exchange. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Just that little bit of information right there. Praise the Lord. Mount Moriah. Look, you studied out. It was Salem. Jerusalem. Who was, captured, who, who was held up, penned up in Jerusalem? It was the Jebusites. Remember, the one tribe, the one tribe that, that Joshua couldn't seem to overcome. And we see years later, David is on the battlefield with Goliath, and he takes the head off Goliath. If you read the scriptures, when he's conquered Goliath, he took his head off, he packed up his armor and put it in his tent. David didn't have a tent. The tent was referring to the tabernacle. 
He gave that victory as a gift to God to the tabernacle, including Goliath's sword, and he took the head, and the Bible says clearly he stood outside the walls of Jerusalem with the head of Goliath. The, the, the Jebusites were laughing and mocking. Nobody can penetrate our walls. We're protected. And David held up this. Twelve years later, David conquered that city. He said, you see this? The God that delivered this is going to deliver this city to me. <laughs> so, well, no, he went back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the capital. Jerusalem wasn't the capital of Israel until David's king, uh, king reigned. He wasn't king yet. Jerusalem was not the capital. Jerusalem was held up, it was held, still held uh, in, in, by the Jebusites. That's just a little side information that was in my notes, so I give it to you anyway. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I got reading this. I'm going to give it, I'm going to finish up with this story. Uh, um, how many has ever read about Elijah uh, and in the, the famine that hit Samaria? Remember, remember, if you want to look it up, it's 2 Kings chapter 7. I was reading this, and, and, and God showed me something in this scripture, but it, there was four leprous men that sat outside the city. Let me get, not get ahead of myself. The fact is, is there was a famine that was set up. The enemy had pinned them in, and they're behind walls, closed walls. So basically the Syrians were the enemies that came in to, to go ahead and, and, um, and, and, and stop the flow of any kind of resources. The famine got so bad that they just sat outside the city. They camped outside the city and waited and just waited for them to starve to death is what they're waiting for, and they're going to conquer the city without even any, any fuss at all. They're sitting outside, so, so, the, uh, so, the, so the conditions in Samaria got so bad that the, some of the uh, uh, Israelites were even resorting to cannibalism to survive. This is how bad it was. Elijah was a prophet in that day, and, he, and, and these four leprous men, now leprous means they had a skin disease called leprosy. Basically, they weren't allowed in the city. They were social uh, outcasts, and, and, and they're sitting outside. Then four men get talking in this scripture. It says, now there were four leopard men at the entrance of the gate, and they said one to another, why are we sitting here until we die? Now, they mouth three ways to die, but only one way to live. <laughs> now, would you call that hopeless? <laughs> if you're thinking on three ways to die and only one way to live, wouldn't you call that hopeless? This is a unique story. This is really cool. Anyway, he said, why do we sit here? If we enter the city, the famine in the city, we shall die. If we sit here, we're going to die. Uh, now, therefore, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we live. If they don't, they kill us, we die. Now, I don't know about you what kind of week you had this week, but when literally you can see nothing in the line of living or hope, but only in to die, that's pretty, that's pretty bleak. So what their solution was, well, instead of just sitting here waiting to die, why don't we surrender to the enemy? All of a sudden, they get this idea. This famine went on for, for quite a while. How come all of a sudden they get the idea, well, we're just going to go ahead. Let's just go ahead and surrender to the enemy. Now, the enemy wasn't looking for them. They weren't go, about to go into the city. The king wasn't going to open and let them in. So they're just sitting there. So, so why not just go on about life? The enemy doesn't seem to care about you. Uh, uh, the king's not going to care about you. Why don't you just go someplace else or, or, or whatever? So, so what, all of a sudden, sitting there with this skin disease, which separated them from society, their families or whatever, that's what they did back then. They isolated them, uh, kind of like the coronavirus. Praise the Lord. And, and, and so what happened? What changed circumstances around? Because we know what happened. We happened so happened that as they were marching to the Syrian army, as they were marching down the road, God did something to the ears of the enemy that they couldn't even hear themselves. And all of a sudden, as they're marching, the, what God did is every footstep of that leprous man, four of them, marching down, he turned and amplified it and made the enemy hear chariots rolling down the highway, coming towards them, and right away, one of the people one guy say, that said, he says, my God, he said, the, the Israelites had hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to come and kill us. 
those are two feared armies, and they were mercenaries. They would, they would, they would uh, kill for hire. <laughs> so he said, and, and so the sound of them, so basically they took off and they ran and left behind all the food, all the riches that they had been plundering through all the lands, and they, they, they kept it there. So here's these four little lepers, but they don't know what's going on. They still ain't got a clue. They walk up there, and here's all this food laying around. They were unattended to what Elijah had said, so they didn't have that in, in, in their eyes. But what happened, that happened because one man heard what the Spirit of the Lord had said, then he confessed it out of his mouth and told the king what was about to happen. So to understand that, you have to go back to king, uh, 2 Kings 7, 1 through 2, and it says this, Then Elijah said, Hear the word of the Lord. Now this happened before they started marching. I, I'm, I'm backing up on the story. He says, he says uh, hear now the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, tomorrow at this time a measure of flour will be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley will be sold for a shekel. In other words, what he did in bringing the prophecy of the Lord forth, he was saying, food's going to be cheaper tomorrow. In a famine, uh, it's very expensive and non-existent because they're starving. But he said, tomorrow it's going to be changed. The captain... It says in verse 2, the captain whose hand the king leaned on, took his advice from, uh, sound familiar, uh, said to me, he says, sure, when God opens up the windows of heaven. In other words, mocking the prophet. So Elijah says, okay, he says, because you said that, he says, you will see this happen, but you won't partake of it. I think one of the worst things is to see what we could have had, but because we doubted and mocked, now we have nothing. What actually happened is when the gates of Samaria did open, when they realized that these four leper's men had run off the enemy. <laughs> and there's, there's all the goods and stuff sitting there. They, it took them days to cart all the goods back to the city of Samaria. This man was trampled in the stampede to get to the food. He saw it, but then he trampled there. Well, what happened? Elijah, the day before these guys moved, he had prophesied the word of the Lord didn't give all the details, but he says, tomorrow this is going to be okay. Why? He heard insight that God had that he didn't even under, understand completely, but he had the insight. So what's the point, Pastor? I'm praying, not only is the hearing of the Lord detrimental in everything that we do in life, it's the confessing of that same word that puts into motion the things that God's going to bring the answer for. In other words, we have an involvement in this hearing. It's not about hearing only but it's about hearing, confessing with our mouth, believing in our hearts, and have God bring it to pass. Hmm. What's that noise I hear? Ah, just four leprous men running down the highway. How many has ever been so desperate that I don't know what we're going to do next? Maybe from the pandemic, maybe from a job loss, maybe from a... Well, I don't know what we're going to do. I, I just don't know what we're going to do. By confessing that doesn't make you any smarter. By confessing that doesn't give you a thing what to do. It just tells you what, well, I, I just don't know what we're going to do. I, I don't know how we're going to make it. I don't know what we're going to do. Are you here? That thought will always come. I guess the best thing for us to do is just surrender to the enemy. This church thing don't seem to be working out. Let's go ahead and just surrender to the enemy. I, I don't get anything out of those messages. We'll just go ahead and surrender to the enemy. These guys didn't either. These guys didn't even hear the message. But the message was spoke nonetheless. I said this years ago. I said when I first came to Key West, I says, here's what I believe. I was in prayer one day. I says, why am I here? You know, I, I used to ask the Lord a lot back in the early days, in the 1990s. I said, why am I here? <laughs> I could be other places. Why am I here? Key West. Why Key West? And, and, and God would never answer that thing. He said, but he would tell me this. He says, you can go, you can go preach the gospel any place you want to. But he said, do you want your will or my will? Hmm. He says, so, so he says, why here? Why here? And over the years, God began to unfold. That's one, another thing. Hearing the voice of the Lord is not going to come up with an immediate answer a lot of times. But it began to unfold the purpose. And as we look back over the thousands and thousands of people that this church has impacted their lives. How many of them right now watch me live stream, used to be part of this church, now live someplace else. Guess what? God shrunk the distance to give the messages again that come out of this church and the anointing on it. Are you here? Yeah. So I asked God, he said, do you want, he said, I'll, I'll bless you any place you want to go start a church. 
A lot of them did. A lot, I saw a lot of ministers leave, leave this place. I said, no, I said, I said, not my will, but your will. I'll confess the words of Jesus. Not my will, but your will be done. He says, dig in for the long haul. That's what he told me. I remember the word, dig in for the long haul. Dig in and do not be moved. In other words, don't let your face turn from me and turn to the impossible and surrender to the enemy. Amen. Don't ever let your face turn to me. And, and he said, as long as you'll do that, I will give you the next, the next thing you need to know. And I'll give you the next, this, this is what I heard the Lord speak of. Oh, you know, I can, I can test, give testimony to me. How many people have thrown their hands up? There was about 150 or more pastors that went through this town in that amount of time that came here, said they, they, they heard the voice of the Lord, came here, stayed here, didn't work out, and they left. Somewhere around there. I don't have the exact number, but somewhere around there. Amen. Praise the Lord. God says, listen and hear. He said, but how many have, like these four lepers, would, would kind of just, well, I just give up. I don't know. Surrender to the enemy. We don't use those words a lot of times, but in our actions, that's exactly what we do. Well, we used to believe and we used to stand on God's word and get excited. You imagine when you first got born again and God took that burden off of your shoulders? What happened to that excitement? Serving the Lord. Well, I don't know. Church is just boring. Well, these guys were bored. They didn't know what to do. They were sitting out there, lepers. Uh, I guess they were bored too. They, they sat around waiting for something to happen. Finally, they just got tired. Did you ever get sick and tired of being sick and tired? And they just go ahead and do something. Without even knowing that somebody else had got a prophetic word, that prophet got a prophetic word, and he spoke it forth. They didn't even know why they were moving. Listen, if I'm going to serve the Lord, I want to know why I'm moving. Amen. I don't want to just blindly bump through life, hope to hit something that is righteous. Amen. No, I want to hear the plan of God. I want to be there ready to move when he says to move. I want to be ready to release my faith when he says to release my faith and stand and trust in him. This is what we're coming back to. This is what, so it's imperative that I hear the voice of God. Understand something. How many has ever been in a meeting? Can you, you think of a, a, a survey here. How many has ever been in a meeting and can feel, can't explain it, but you can feel the presence of God? Raise your hand if you've ever felt the presence of God. Isn't that amazing? You just heard him speak. One way, but you just heard him speak. The presence of God, what is it? Isn't God the word? The presence of God is the same as him speaking. But we're looking for that audible voice to give us that word that we need for tomorrow. And we miss over the very presence and the opportunity to be in his presence with other believers, lifting each other up and praying for each other and being in a corporate. We, we had, we had uh, what we call a prayer meeting. I don't know what you call our meetings on Saturday nights. We call it prayer meeting. But um, all of a sudden, we're hanging around. You know, we started at about 6 o'clock. We we're still hanging around 8 o'clock laughing. I said, this is one fun church. <laughs> we're saying, and we're just enjoying not anything deep spiritual. We're not in, in, in great intensity as far as breakthrough. But we're just sitting there. And we, but somehow, God just showed up at the meeting. And we were just all having fun. We were just enjoying each other's company. Is that a prayer meeting? You better believe it. Like you would never believe. Because here's what God is looking for as a heavenly father. He's looking for us to come into his presence and just sit down. What if you had kids that the only time they wanted to talk to you was when they needed something? Hmm. Are you here? What if you had a kid like Jonah? Remember Jonah? I remember Jonah. You know, the big, big fish guy? Jonah. What happened? He heard the word of the Lord, and he went 2,500 miles in the wrong direction, where he could have gone 550 miles in the right direction. But because he didn't like what God said, he turned his back on him, and he left. He got on a boat, bound outside Tel Aviv. That's where it was. Gets on a, on a ship and he's heading for Tarsus. You know where Tarsus is? The rock by the rocks of, by the uh, Gibraltar, which is by Spain. That's all the way across the Mediterranean. So he, Nineveh <clears throat> is Mosul, Iraq. It's only 550 mile direction from from where he was standing. 
Okay, well, so instead he gets on a ship that goes clear over to, 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 to what we call the Gibraltar Straits, or by Spain, uh, at the other end of the Mediterranean Sea. Before he gets that far, all of a sudden a storm comes up. Now, if Jonah had stayed on the boat, they all would have died. The storm was a killer. It was, they all would have died. So it was even Jonah's consensus, listen, guys, just throw me overboard. I'm the problem. I'm running from God, and I'm, I'm the, just throw me overboard. So they throw him overboard. What happens next? Everyone know what happens next? I thought about this story one time. I was diving to Vandenberg. Uh, Diane and I are avid scuba divers, if you don't already know that. And, and, and I went over to the port side on the wreck of the Vandenberg, and I see three huge Goliath groupers, big ones. I'm talking about as big as me. Three of them. Not just one or two, three of them. So I, jump, I, I go over to the side, I come down to about the 130 foot level, and I'm watching, this, and so I got my video camera going, and I'm looking, and I'm looking through the viewfinder, and all of a sudden I see, well, there's one, there's two, where's the third one? And I look down like this, and here comes a fish like this, up, and I think, you know what? I know just how Jonah feels. <laughs> uh, I mean, now, I don't think it was a Goliath grouper that was, uh, Jonah was after. Uh, um, they, they used to call him Jewfish. Now the guy's political term is a Goliath grouper. I asked a, a fellow on the boat one time, a Jewish fellow on the boat, I says, how did a, how did a Jewfish become an a, 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 a uncircumcised Philistine? Uh, but anyway, but it, it's in the names. But he uh, said, so here comes, I said, man, I know just how he feels. I lost him for a minute. Of course, the fish just swam. He didn't, he didn't do nothing. And it didn't look like bait to him. And it's probably too big to swallow. But I thought about that. But God sent this great fish, and he swallows up Jonah. I think that's the end. How many has ever been in a circumstance or situation, that's the end? Do you know what that fish was? That was to save his life, even in his disobedience. God had mercy to save his life. Now, I don't... I don't know if you ever want to be in the side of a whale. Uh, I listen to marine biologists say, well, it, you know, the stomach acids will eat you up. But the Bible does say that God prepared this big fish, if it's a whale or whatever it is. I do know there's a thing called a fin whale. It's in the Mediterranean. It has two stomachs. So a lot of people possibly, well, possibly he could be in one stomach while the food's digesting in the other stomach, you know, and by the time it gets to, he just, you know, barfs him up on the beach. Regardless, anybody here want to get inside of a fish? For three days, huh? Hmm. The darkest place that Jonah ever found himself in, the most challenging place ever found himself in, was to save his life. <laughs> God provided the fish to save his life. I don't know about you, but I'd just rather hear God the first time and just do what he says. Has God got a fish? That's what we usually put in the message. Has God got a fish for you? <laughs> now I spend a lot of time in the ocean and under the ocean most of the time under the ocean uh, I, I don't want a guy to have a fish for me I want to hear him the, the first time I want to get his voice clear to the first time one more scripture I'm going to end with this scripture 2 Corinthians write this down if you want to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2 uh, verse 20 uh, of the NIV it says no matter how many promises God has made they are yes in Christ, and so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Amen. I'll read it again. This is the NIV version says it this way. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes. How many can think of a promise of God? Yes. It's, it, the answer is yes. This is what he's saying. No matter how many promises of God, he said, or yes in Christ. But he said this, he said, and so through him, the amen is spoken by us. Now here's what you think. Amen is something we put at the end of a prayer. When we're done with a prayer, it means amen. That's not what it means. I know we do that. I know we use it for the end of a sentence, but that's not what, it's not a period at the end of a sentence. The word amen means, yes, I agree to the point where I will carry it out. That's what it means. That's what the word amen means. It means I agree, and my agreement means I will carry out exactly what was spoken. So here the promises in Christ are yes in Christ. So all the promises God got, yes, but the amen remains with us. So it's a so be it, are we going to carry it out or not? 
Now God says, I give you the promise, but are you saying amen? If you're saying amen, say, that's right, I'm going to do everything I do to carry out uh, my end of that promise. But as far as God's concerned, he's saying, yes, the promises are there. Amen? amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Now I'll say it again, Revelation chapter 2, 17 says, He who have ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches. Not necessarily to the individual, but to the churches. This is a church. How many have ears to hear this morning what the Spirit of the Lord has said to this church? Amen. Amen. How many can see now where it's imperative that we hear, not only hear, but act upon what he said? Amen. Praise the Lord. How many got something on the message this morning? Amen. How many got something new to take away from out of this message this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. How many are going <laughs> to How many are going to listen to the Lord intently? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Understand how God works. Uh, I've gone through different courses in schools and different things, especially going through uh, Christian International uh, School of the Holy Spirit and so on and so forth. And they would teach us different ways. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews, it says, Hebrews 10, it says, He who has his senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, to dis- there's a discernment that takes place. All these voices and all these things, all these ideas and all these problems in the world are sitting there waiting for the discernment. Which is God, which isn't God, so on and so forth. How do we find that out? Well, basically, simply, God will not do anything against his word or aside from his word. Right? So we understand what his will by reading his word. Okay? We meditate it, but then we hear how does that carry out in our life. Jesus said this, he said, John 10, 10, one of my favorite scriptures, he says, the thief cometh but to kill, steal, and destroy, but I say, I can and give you life and life more abundant. But the life that we're living now is too far from abundance. Would the abundant life that Jesus said, is that a promise? So guess what, when we say, is that a promise? I only got one amen in this church. Amen. Is that a promise? Amen. Is abundant life a promise? Amen. It's in the scripture, Jesus said it, and he said, it's a, he said, I came to give you life. Did Jesus come to give us life? Okay, is it life abundantly? Because he used the word abundant. Okay, I'm going to say it this way. Abundant life is bigger than what you think it is. And I'll guarantee, almost guarantee it's probably bigger than what you're living. And what I'm living, for that matter. Praise the Lord. Not to talk down, but amen. So what is the promise? The reading from, from uh, verse, 2 Corinthians, what is the promise? All that's missing is the Amen. Once we make the amen and the agreement, now what happens is God begins to give us input on carrying that out. If you're not going to do anything about it, why would he give you the input? Why would God give us a bunch of words and a bunch of phrases and a bunch of things that we're not going to do anything with? Why would God give us a promise when he knows that we probably won't even carry that out. Why would God give us anything for doing nothing? I don't know, I just, these are questions I ask myself. I'm not, I'm not preaching to anybody. These are questions I ask myself. If, um, you know, you get my age, you hear words a lot from different people about retirement. Um, I, I think it's, I, I don't, I'm not looking for retirement. Refirement, yes. Retirement, uh-uh. But, uh, you know, but, but the thing is, why? Well, if God has called me into the ministry, did he say I'm only supposed to be in a certain amount of years? Well, he did. He said uh, uh, that I, as a man, I can live from say, uh, 70 or 80 with strength. And I noticed that when David wrote that down, they all lived it longer than that. <laughs> longer than 80. But the fact is, I got longevity in my family, and muzzles just keep on preaching with it. What else would I, would, I, would I do? In other words, how could you all of a sudden give yourself, give your life to the Lord, and then inadvertently turn your back on those promises or turn your back on those things that he's going to do. What, what is the purpose of fulfilling promises? As an American, we have a culture of com- comfort. So promises which should bring us comfort. So God wants to fix all our problems because we're Americans and we deserve it. You see, if we don't yield as servants, then we get an attitude of entitlement. We either yield to God as his servants or we automatically develop an attitude of entitlement. Help me, boys. I got I to. 
I'm out of time. I, got, I just want to, want to give a last comment there to help somebody along. So praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, I'm not retiring. You're not retiring. We're going to refire. Uh, Jesus is coming back soon, but, we're, but before that, we've got a lot of work to do. Amen. Amen. So praise the Lord. If one prophet can utter one word that the Lord laid on him, in his, laid in his heart, and he heard one word and uttered that one word to move four guys to free an entire nation, hmm, how powerful are the words that come out of our mouths that we hear from God? I'll say it again. One guy, a prophet, one guy, Elijah, heard one word from the Lord about tomorrow's grocery bill. <laughs> Publix is having a sale. That's a divine thing from God. Hallelujah. We're going to get, you know, and, 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 and so we don't think nothing of it. But the fact is, is that when you're starving, all of a sudden tomorrow there's going to be an abundance of food, is what he's saying. Nothing else changed. Nothing else looked different. Have you ever been in a position where nothing else looked different, but yet God is going to change everything? And he used four leprous men that didn't even know what they were doing. Is there somebody out there that they don't even know what they're doing or why they're doing it, but they're just doing it for your benefit? Because God gave you a word and you confess it out and now God is moving things to you. Praise the Lord. I'm going to end this morning of prayer. I have my mask if somebody wants me to pray for them. We'll, like we normally do every Sunday, we'll open, an, open the altar for prayer. Uh, um, if you want a prayer of agreement of anything, whatever the prayer need, you, you can come down. Uh, if you wear a mask, we, I'll wear my mask to, so you feel better. And uh, if not, then I'll just pray for you this morning as we pray and believe God. We've done this now for a while. This is where we get to pray. This is where we're seeing God's hand work and we're seeing miracles happen. How many got something out of the Word this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, I often say that at the, at the end of the service, but what I want to also say, how many got something out of the praise and worship this morning? Amen. How many got something when they walked through the door Amen. and something lifted off them as they walked through the threshold? We've had this, I've had testimonies of that, by the way. Okay, walking through the door and something lift. Yes. How many all of a sudden now listen to this Word have gotten a new enlightenment? Hmm. All these things are positive, isn't it? Aren't you glad you went to church? Yeah. I did more for you this morning than your vitamin tablets did. <laughs> well, I didn't. Jesus did. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's stand there. We're gonna cl we'll close in prayer, and then anybody wants to come down, I'll be, we'll come down. I'll pray, lay hands on you once we're off camera. Praise the Lord. Uh, Amen. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. And Lord, though we went kind of in depth in some things, I pray, Lord, that something was said this morning that somebody can grab a hold of and change their life. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. I pray for everybody here this morning. Now, let me ask you, I'm going to say this. Is there anybody here this morning that has never made Jesus Lord of their life? If you do, just slip up a hand say, I don't want to leave the building until, until Pastor prays, and I want, to, I want the assurance of salvation. Okay, so you're all, you're all in the boat. Okay, praise the Lord. Now, how many uh, of all, all you that are in the boat, how many want to hear better from God? Okay. This will be it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise. We thank you for it. Blessings, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. And we thank you, Father God, for this time we had together. But, Lord, let your presence be known like never before to your people. In Jesus' name, we give you the praise and honor. And everybody said? God bless you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.